was a concept called the new Mysterianism. It was coined by a philosopher, Owen Flanagan, who defined it as a postmodern position designed to drive a railroad spike through the heart of scientism by holding that consciousness may never be completely explained. And the term has been extended uh, to broader questions about the scope and nature of uh, explanations accessible to human intelligence. I'll use the term in the broader sense, which seems to me the more significant one. Actually, I'm cited as one of the culprits responsible for this strange postmodern heresy, uh, which I happily accept, though I would prefer a different term for it, namely truism. Uh, that's, that's what I thought 40 years ago uh, in proposing a distinction between problems which fall within our cognitive capacities, maybe very hard, but in principle fall within them, and mysteries uh, which do not fall within them at all. Uh, I was borrowing terms from uh, Charles Sanders Peirce's account of what he called abduction, uh, the concept in his words that the human mind is a biological system uh, that provides the mind with certain admissible hypotheses which are the foundations of human knowledge and of science and then as a matter of simple logic these must exclude others that are inaccessible to us altogether or perhaps too remote on some accessibility hierarchy to be accessible in fact, though they might be for a differently structured mind. Uh, Peirce's abduction is uh, sometimes interpreted in the philosophical literature as inference to the best explanation, uh, but that's not quite accurate. Uh, crucially, Peirce uh, insisted on what he called the limits of admissible hypotheses, which he took to be quite narrow for quite good reasons, um, to be a prerequisite for, in his words, imagining correct theories. Now, Peirce was concerned with the growth of scientific knowledge, but the same logic uh, holds for acquisition of common sense understanding. Uh, all of this does seem to me close to truism, if not necessarily for the reasons that have led many distinguished figures over the centuries to somewhat similar conclusions. Now, the reason it's truism is that if we are biological organisms, not angels, then our cognitive faculties are similar to those that are called physical capacities, and they should be studied much as other systems of the body are. Uh, these truisms, and that's what they are, are commonly rejected in the study of mental faculties the language in particular. That, that seems to me one instance of a curious tendency to treat mental aspects of the human organism differently from so-called physical aspects. It's a kind of methodological dualism, which is much more pernicious than Cartesian metaphysical dualism. Now, the latter was a respectable scientific hypothesis proven wrong, as respectable scientific hypotheses regularly are, proven wrong when uh, Newton demonstrated a few years later uh, that uh, uh, one of the two substances that Descartes had postulated doesn't exist, namely body. Newton demonstrated that there are no machines uh, that undermine the, what was called the mechanical philosophy mechanical science, uh, which was the foundations of early modern science from Galileo on. And uh, by doing so, by eliminating the concept of body, physical, mechanical, and so on, uh, Newton also uh, eliminated the mind-body problem, at least in its Cartesian form. Uh, methodological dualism, in contrast, has absolutely nothing to recommend it. And if that's true, I think it is, then Mysterianism is indeed just a variety of truism, along with uh, what's called internalism. This is contrary to views widely held, as philosophers among you will know. <laughs>
Well, as uh, David Hume put the matter not long after, I'll quote him, we must keep to the Newtonian philosophy with a modest skepticism to a certain degree and with a fair confession of ignorance in subjects that exceed all human capacity. And for Hume, that includes virtually everything beyond appearances. We must, he said, refrain from disquisitions concerning their real nature and operations. It is the imagination, a kind of magical faculty in the soul, which is inexplicable by the utmost efforts of human understanding, can't possibly comprehend it, and it's that mystical system, magical system, uh, that leads us to believe that we experience external continuing objects, uh, so-called physical or so-called mind and self. Well, all of this is thoroughgoing Mysterianism. Uh, that would include the quandaries that were considered to be the hard problems in the early days of modern science and philosophy in the 17th and 18th century. Uh, the most troublesome of the hard problems in that era had to do with the nature of motion, of attraction and repulsion. The problems, incidentally, that were never solved, but were rather abandoned and uh, so understood by the more perceptive observers, like uh, John Locke and David Hume, recognized to be permanent mysteries, at least mysteries for humans, uh, some other structured intelligence might see things differently. Now, that was incidentally well understood at the time, forgotten now, but well understood in those days. So Locke uh, wrote that his words, we remain in incurable ignorance of what we desire to know about matter and its effects, and no science of bodies that provides true explanations is within our reach. Uh, nevertheless, he says, we, he was convinced by the judicious Mr. Newton's incomparable book, Principia, that it's too bold a presumption to limit God's power in this point by my narrow conceptions. So though gravitation of matter to matter is, Locke wrote, inconceivable to me as it was to Newton, and nevertheless, as Newton demonstrated, we must recognize that it was in it, it is within God's power to put into bodies powers and ways of operations above what can be derived from our idea of body or can be explained by what we can know of matter. And thanks to Newton's work, we know that he has done so. Uh, given <coughs> Mysterian truisms, what is inconceivable to us is no criterion for what can exist. And Newton agreed in his constant search for some way to avoid what he called the absurd conclusion that objects interact at a distance. He speculated that God, who is everywhere, might be the immaterial agent uh, implementing gravitational interactions. But he could go no further since in his famous phrase, he would not feign hypotheses beyond what could be experimentally established. So he left it as a mystery. And uh, Newton agreed with his most eminent critic, Leibniz, that interaction without contact is inconceivable, although he did not agree that uh, divine intervention, his only explanation, uh, would leave such attraction as in his words in unaccountable, un, an unreasonable occult property. It's referring back to debates about neo-scholasticism. Well, accordingly, the goals of scientific inquiry were implicitly restricted from the intelligibility of nature, which was in fact the criterion for true understanding in early modern science, Galilean science and its successors, uh, restrict, uh, abandon that and uh, move to something much narrower, intelligibility of theories about the world. It's quite a different concept. Now, that seems to me a step of considerable significance in the history of human thought and inquiry, 
uh, much more so than is generally recognized. It's been kind of assimilated into the common scientific common sense of the subsequent period without recognition of how much of early modern science was simply abandoned as beyond our capacities. Uh, this bears directly on the scope of Mysterianism in the broad sense. Uh, John Locke went on to conclude that just as God had added to matter such inconceivable properties as gravitational attraction, he might also have super added to matter a capacity of thought. And if we replace God by nature, that opens the way to inquiry a path that was in fact pursued extensively in the years that followed, right through the 18th century, uh, leading to the conclusion that th uh, thought is simply a property of certain forms of organized matter. Uh, Darwin restated the fairly common 18th century understanding by saying that there is no need to regard thought, a secretion of the brain, as more wonderful than gravity, a property of matter. Uh, inconceivable to us, but that's a fact about our cognitive limitations, not about the nature of the world. Uh, some of the uh, early modern understanding of these matters, Newton through, Dar through Darwin, uh, some of it has been rediscovered in very recent years, uh, sometimes with a sense of wonderment. Uh, for example, Francis Crick formulated what he called his astonishing hypothesis that our mental and emotional states are in fact no more than the behavior of a vast assembly of nerve cells and their associated molecules. Uh, in the philosophical literature, this rediscovery has sometimes been described as a radical new idea in the study of mind, I'm quoting. As Paul Churchland puts it, quoting John Searle, uh, the new idea is the bold assertion that mental phenomena are entirely natural and caused by the neurophysiological properties, activities of the brain. Uh, these proposals restate in virtually the same, same words the formulations of centuries ago, which have been forgotten, after the traditional mind-body problem became unformulable with the disappearance of the only coherent notion of body or physical or material and so on. For example, Joseph Priestley's conclusion end of the 18th century that properties termed mental reduce to the organical structure of the brain, a concept stated in different words by Locke, Darwin, and many others, almost inescapable, it would seem, after the collapse of the mechanical philosophy which provided the foundations for early modern science. Uh, the last decade of the 20th century was designated as the decade of the brain. Uh, there's a collection of essays uh, reviewing the results published by the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and it contains an introduction by a, a distinguished neuroscientist, Vernon Mountcastle, now he formulates the guiding theme as, his words, the thesis of the new biology that things mental, indeed minds, are emergent properties of brains, though these emergences are produced by principles that we do not yet understand. Uh, once again, reiterating 18th century observations in virtually the same words. Uh, the phrase we do not yet understand, however, should strike a note of caution. Uh, we might remember Bertrand Russell's observation in 1927, the year is important, that chemical laws cannot at present be reduced to physical laws. Uh, that was a fact, and it was a fact that led many eminent scientists, including Nobel laureates, to regard chemistry as not really a science, but just a mode of computation that for some reason could predict experimental results, but not real science, because uh, it couldn't be reduced to physics. Uh, as soon was discovered, Russell's observation, though correct, was understated. 
uh, chemical laws were indeed not reducible to physical laws as physics was then understood and remained irreducible and still are, uh, though after physics underwent radical changes with the quantum theoretic revolution, which was just taking place at that time, uh, the new physics, entirely different physics, was unified with a virtually unchanged chemistry. Chemistry was never reduced to physics. It was irreducible to physics. Physics changed and unified with an unchanged chemistry. And there may be lessons here, I think there are, for neuroscience and philosophy of mind. So contemporary neuroscience is nowhere near as well established as physics was a century ago. Uh, in fact, what are, there are what seem to me quite cogent critiques of uh, its foundational assumptions. Uh, recently in an important book by Gallistow and King, two fine cognitive neuroscientists, uh, the common slogan uh, that study of mind is neuroscience at an abstract level, it might prove to be just as misleading as comparable statements about chemistry 90 years ago. Uh, doesn't sound too long ago to me when I was a, was when I was a child that chemistry and physics were finally unified uh, with Linus Pauling's uh, dis discovery of a quantum theoretic basis for the chemical bond. Well, returning to the uh, impact of Newton's discoveries, his greatest achievement, uh, David Hume wrote, was to draw the veil from some of the mysteries of nature while also restoring nature's ultimate secrets to that obscurity in which they ever did and ever will remain, uh, we may add for humans at least. Other in forms of intelligence might view the world quite differently. Now, all of this is a dedicated mysterianism for very substantial reasons, including the leading figures of our intellectual, scientific, tr philosophical tradition. Well, uh, as regards consciousness, it entered modern philosophy, philosophical discourse, at about the same time. Uh, there's a recent comprehensive uh, scholarly study of this range of topics by Udo Thiel, a kind of gold standard in the field. Uh, he points out that the first English philosopher to make extensive use of the noun consciousness with a philosophical meaning was Ralph Cudworth in the 1670s, though it was not until 50 years later that consciousness became an object of inquiry in its own right. And subsequently, consciousness was identified with thought, as in fact it already had been by Descartes. And for some, like uh, Wilhelm von Humboldt, great linguist, a thought was further identified with language, which provides the language of thought, modern phrase, but same idea, uh, ideas that can be partially reconstructed in contemporary terms. Well, in the modern period, identification of thought with consciousness reappears in various ways. For example, in Quine's thesis that rule following reduces either to fitting as uh, the planets fit Kepler's laws or by guide or guiding by conscious thought, only two kinds. Uh, John Searle's connection principle holds that operations of the mind must be somehow accessible to conscious experience. It's actually an idea that's almost impossible to formulate coherently. Uh, but whether taken to be empirical claims or terminological stipulations, uh, these doctrines uh, rule out much of what has been discovered about rule following in uh, language or perception, other domains of cognitive science. That includes the basic rules of language, which do not have that property, or what uh, uh, Donald Hoffman, cognitive scientist, uh, his study of what he calls vis visual, visual intelligence, what he calls the rigidity rule. That's the rule that image projections are interpreted as 
projections of rigid motions in three dimensions, uh, even with highly impoverished stimuli, obviously by mechanisms that are totally inaccessible to consciousness. And that's rule following beyond the most superficial level. Uh, there is all of which is ruled out by contemporary philosophical doctrine, which tells us something about the doctrine, I think. Uh, there's reason to believe that what reaches consciousness, even potentially, may well be just a scattered reflection of inaccessible mental processes which interact uh, intimately with uh, fragments that reach consciousness. There's now famous experiments, which some of you may know about, the Libet experiment on decision-making. They provide some independent evidence about this matter, though what they show is that milliseconds before a conscious decision to do something, say, pick this up, uh, there's already uh, activity in the relevant parts of the motor cortex. Uh, that's been interpreted as having some bearing on freedom of will, but I think that's just an error. Just says that whatever decisions and choices are made are beyond accessibility to consciousness. Uh, if this is correct, as it seems to be, then the recent focus on conscious awareness or accessibility to conscious uh, may be an error. It may, in fact, seriously impede the development of a science of mind. Now, these are topics of considerable interest, no time to pursue them here. Well, instead of that, let's return to Mysterianism in the broad sense, not restricted to consciousness, uh, taking it to be truism, as I think it is. Well, we can consider various kinds of mysteries. Uh, some of them are quite far reaching, such as those I mentioned, uh, probably permanent mysteries for humans. Uh, I'll return to these, but before doing that, uh, it's worth considering mysteries of a kind that are narrower, the cases that might fall within our cognitive capacities uh, and where there might in principle be relevant empiri empirical evidence, though it's impossible for us to obtain it. It's an interesting category of mysteries or even narrower cases where uh, ethical considerations bar experiments that might answer questions that we can sensibly pose. So for example, a lot is known about the neurology of the human visual system, thanks to invasive experiments with cats and monkeys. But we can't learn anything about language that way. Uh, there is simply nothing homologous known in the animal world. And relevant human experiments, which you can think of, are barred. Possibly some barriers might erode with new technology, but that's so far just a hope. Well, among these mysteries, uh, at least now, maybe forever, is the question of the uh, origins of the atomic concepts for thought and language, roughly words, but not quite. Uh, these are quite different in human thought and language from anything that's found in systems of animal communication. There seems to be a total discontinuity. Uh, the latter, animal systems, appear to be linked directly to entities in the extramental uh, world can be identified without any consideration of uh, the symbolic system itself. So uh, take a vervet monkey has five signals, five calls. Uh, one of them is associated with fluttering of leaves. Uh, we interpret that to mean a predator's coming. I don't know what the monkeys do. Uh, another uh, might be associated with a detectable hormonal change, which we interpret as meaning I'm hungry. Uh, that appears to be quite general. And uh, across all known animal systems and totally different from human language where even the simplest elements, simplest words lack this property uh, contrary to a conventional referentialist doctrine uh, which holds that there is a direct relation between words and extramental entities. That's 
illustrated in the titles of standard works like uh, Quine's Word and Object or Roger Brown's Word and Things in an extensive literature. Uh, furthermore, the associations for animal symbol systems are of a kind quite different from anything in human language. Uh, one of the leading specialists on the topic, uh, Laura Ann Petito, uh, who directed the famous NIM project, uh, she writes that uh, chimps, unlike humans, use labels in a way that seems to rely heavily on some global notion of association. So a chimp will use the same label, we take it to be apple, uh, to refer to the action of eating apples, the location where apples are kept, uh, events and locations of objects other than apples that happen to be stored with an apple, uh, say the knife that was used to cut it, and so on and so forth, all simultaneously and without apparent recognition of the relevant differences or the advantages of being able to distinguish among them. In contrast, even in the first, uh, the first words of uh, a young, young human baby, she's intensively studied human babies, uh, these are used in a concept-constrained way. Uh, but the usage of chimps, even after years of training and of communication with humans, never displays this sensitivity to differences among natural kinds. So surprisingly, she concludes, chimps do not really have names for things at all. They only have a hodgepodge of loose associations. Uh, human language is radically different except in one respect. It also doesn't have names for things, although for different reasons. The atomic concepts of human language and thought, kind of word-like elements, do not pick out entities of the extra mental world, uh, entities that, say, a physicist could discover without investigating the human mind. So there apparently is no notion of reference or denotation for human language, though of course there are actions of referring and denoting something quite different. Uh, one can posit a circumstance-dependent relation of something like reference derived from acts of referring. So for example, the name Jones refers to the person Jones and Incidentally, the notion of person is far from an innocent notion. It can do so insofar as we refer to him by using the name in some particular circumstances. But the act of referring is the only really functioning notion, contrary to widespread belief. Uh, this much, incidentally, was already clear to Aristotle. Uh, he concluded that, quoting him, we can define a house as stones, bricks, and timbers in terms of the material constitution, but also as a receptacle to, sh to shelter chattels and living beings in terms of function and design. And Aristotle says we must combine both parts of the definition, integrating matter and form, since the essence of a house involves the purpose and end of the material constitution. Hence, a house is not a mind-independent object. And that becomes still clearer when we investigate the meaning of the word further. It's no time to go into it, but you find that very quickly. And uh, we discover that the concept house has much more complex properties, uh, universally, across languages. That's an observation that generalizes to every word you can think of. Uh, inquiry reveals that even the simplest words have quite intricate meanings. Uh, notice that Aristotle was defining the entity house, not the word house. For him, it's a matter of metaphysics. In fact, I've been quoting from his metaphysics. Uh, the entity is a combination of matter and form. Uh, in the 17th century, there was a kind of a cognitive revolution and this general point of view shifted towards seeking uh, what were called innate cognoscative processes, it's Cudworth, uh, 
uh, that enter into our understanding of experience and that reshape experience to conform to our modes of cognition. Uh, uh, summarizing these many years of discussions of such topics, quite rich discussion, and for his own independent reasons, uh, Hume concluded that the identity that we ascribe to minds, vegetables, animal bodies, and other entities is only a fictitious one established by the imagination upon like objects and not a particular nature belonging to this form, something mind independent. Uh, recent studies of acquisition have shown that even the most elementary uh, words, meaning bearing elements, are acquired from very restricted evidence often and often very rapidly during the early years of life, even under severe sensory constraints. It's difficult to see how one can avoid the conclusion that these intricate structures depend on innate cognoscative powers of the kinds that were in fact explored in quite interesting ways during the first cognitive revolution of the 17th century. And intricacies mount very rapidly when you go beyond the simplest elements like words, uh, reinforcing the conclusion that innate properties of the mind play a critical role in uh, their acquisition and use, of course, well beyond accessibility to consciousness. Well, if, uh, if these conclusions do indeed generalize, as seems to be the case, it would follow that natural language has no semantics in the technical sense. A technical sense means relations between symbols and things outside the system, a reference, denotation. A rather, natural language has syntax, some kind of symbol manipulation internal to the mind, and pragmatics, uh, modes of use of language. The field of formal semantics, which include model theoretic semantics, uh, falls under syntax in this categorization. It's a form of symbol manipulation. It's motivated by external world considerations, uh, just as phonology, the study of sound systems, is motivated by external events. But it relates to the world only in quite complex ways in the context of theories of action. Well, these conclusions pose very serious problems for any, any potential theory of the origin of language. As I mentioned, it seems to be the case that animal communication systems are based on a one-to-one -one relation between mind-brain processes and an aspect of the environment to which these processes adapt the animal's behavior. I'm quoting from a standard review. Uh, if so, then the gap between human language and animal communication is as dramatic in this domain as it is in every other domain, the domain of language structure, uh, acquisition, and use. So there is a problem about a radical discontinuity between humans and anything in the animal world, and no time to go into it here, but that discontinuity appears to have emerged very recently, and probably within the last 100,000 years, which is nothing in evolutionary time. Well, let's turn briefly to the objects to which a speaker refers. So we have to ask, what qualifies? Actually, Quine was much concerned with this topic. He observed that in some cases, a noun phrase may not be, I'm quoting, a compelling candidate for thinghood, quoting Daniel Dennett, discussing the issues recently. Dennett observes, Paris and London plainly exist, but do the miles that separate them also exist? And Quine's answer, Dennett writes, is that a noun phrase of this kind, like miles, is defective and its putative reference need not be taken seriously from an ontological point of view. And there do seem to be 
distinctions among candidates for things good, things good. But uh, questions arise very quickly. So take, say, the word thing. Now, that should be a compelling candidate for thinghood, you might imagine. Uh, but what are the identity conditions for things? Uh, how many of them are there? How can we find out? Well, suppose, for example, that we see some branches uh, strewn on the ground. If they fell from a tree after a storm, they're not a thing. But if they were placed there carefully by an artist as a work of conceptual art, uh, maybe given a name, then the construction is a thing, it might win an award, an art exhibit. And a little thought will show that complex factors enter into determining whether some part of the world constitutes a thing that includes human intention and design, Aristotelian form, which are not properties that can be detected by study of the mind-independent world. And if thing doesn't qualify for thinghood, what does? Answer, I suspect nothing. Uh, what about Dennett's examples, Paris and London, which he says are uh, stand, uh, uh, prototypical examples of real things? Well, we can refer to them. So if I were to say I visited London the year before it was destroyed by a great fire and then rebuilt with entirely different materials and design, uh, 50 miles up the Thames, where I intend to revisit it next year, uh, London, I'm referring to London. But evidently, the extra mental world doesn't, doesn't contain an entity with properties like that. Uh, an entity that a physicist could, in principle, discover. Uh, we can, however, refer to London, uh, either by using the name London or by a pronoun linked to it, or by some more complex phrase, uh, maybe my favorite city or something else. Uh, what this means is that in my internal language, whatever's stored up here, uh, there is an internal entity, London, not necessarily matching yours exactly, uh, constituted of elements that provide perspectives for referring to aspects of the world, something that is uh, familiar to phonologists. It's similar to the way that the features of the internal phonetic element, say ta, provide means for me to pronounce and interpret certain events in the world, but it doesn't pick out an entity in the world. Uh, in these terms, uh, classical paradoxes have become impossible to formulate. That's from Plutarch's Ship of Theseus to uh, Saul Kripke's current puzzles, all of which are stated in terms of referentialist assumptions and become unstatable if you uh, reject those assumptions. Uh, with the rise of uh, corpuscular theories, in the 17th century, the focus of investigation into topics like these shifted from individuation, so what makes an individual distinct from others, to the prior question of identity, what makes an individual the same through time despite changes. So for a corpuscularian, uh, like all the great scientists of the 17th century, an individual is just what it is. Quote Robert Boyle, it's a distinct portion of matter uh, which a number of corpuscles make up. Uh, study of identity through time led pretty soon to a cognitive treatment of the issue. As Thiel puts it in his standard work, as substantial forms are denied and no principle of identity could be discovered in the things themselves, it is recognized that their identity must depend on what we regard as their essential constituents, that is, on our criteria for judging, on our concepts of things. This subjectivist revolution, as Thiel calls it, was carried forward particularly by Locke, for whom existence is preserved under the same denomination, that is, in terms of our internal abstract ideas, uh, which we employ to think about the world. Uh, David Hume interprets our uh, 
tendency to assign identity through time as a kind of a natural instinct, which construct like an animal instinct, which construct, construct, constructs experience to conform to the modes of cognition, in Kantian terms, and in ways that sharply differ from anything in the animal world. And this uh, instinct, uh, Hume writes, uh, shows it, it is developed by the imagination which creates concepts that bind a succession of related objects together, leading us to imagine something unknown and mysterious connecting the parts. So ascription of identity is a construction of the imagination and the factors that enter into constructing these fictions become a topic of cognitive science. Although at this point, Hume would have demurred if the imagination is, as he thought, quoting him, a kind of magical faculty which is inexplicable by the utmost efforts of human understanding. Uh, these uh, early modern forms of mysterianism uh, are fundamental. Uh, they lead to a fundamental kind of the sort that I mentioned briefly earlier. Uh, for Locke and for Hume, it follows simply from epistemological considerations that the limits of our understanding are extremely narrow, even in principle. However, Locke and uh, Hume also took quite seriously the new science-based mysterianism that arose from Newton's demolition of the mechanical philosophy, which as I said, had provided the very criterion of intelligibility uh, for the scientific revolution of the 17th century, which was based on the conception of the world as an elaborate machine. It's commonly believed that Newton presented a conception of the world as a machine. That's exactly the opposite. Newton showed that nothing is a machine, and whatever the world is, it's not a machine. Uh, Galileo had insisted that theories are intelligible only under a very restrictive condition, as he put it, if we can duplicate their posits by means of appropriate artificial devices. Now, that was a concept that was maintained by Descartes, Leibniz, Huygens, Newton, uh, all the great figures of the scientific revolution. Accordingly, uh, Newton's discoveries left the world unintelligible when his theological assumptions are dismissed. And the solution that was kind of tacitly reached, as I mentioned earlier, was simply to lower the goals of science, abandoning the search for intelligibility of the world in favor of something much weaker, the search for theories that are intelligible to us, whether or not what they posit is intelligible. So it was quite natural for Bertrand Russell a century ago to dismiss the very idea of an intelligible world as absurd. There is, we'll never get an understanding of the world. That's no longer a reasonable goal for scientific inquiry. Well, while the list of mysterians is long and distinguished, as these examples illustrate, uh, their stance seems to contrast with the exuberant contemporary thesis that the scientific revolution and the enlightenment provided humans with limitless explanatory power as illustrated by the rapid development of modern science. This was recently articulated by physicist David Deutsch who wrote that the great achievements of the enlightenment and modern science, early modern science, was to direct inquiry to the quest of good explanations so that potential progress is unbounded. Uh, philosopher of physics David Albert expounds this thesis with the introduction of that particular habit of concocting and evaluating new hypotheses. There's a sense that we can do anything. The capacities of a community that has mastered this method to survive and to learn and to remake the world according to its inclinations are in the long run literally boundless. 
I can't discern any argument here that addresses the range of the Mysterian concerns and conclusions of the uh, classical literature, which I think are quite sound. Uh, however, the basic, there are basic assumptions here that trace back to Peirce again. He, Peirce did offer an argument. It's related to Albert's con observation about mastering the method to survive. Uh, per Peirce, who was writing right after Darwin, proposed that the, what he called the abductive instinct that allows us to choose among a limited range of admissible hypotheses. He argues that developed through natural selection. Uh, variants that yielded truths about the world yielded a selectional advantage and were retained through Darwinian descent with modifications with others while well, others fell away. Uh, that belief, however, is totally unsustainable. There's nothing in natural selection that equipped humans to uh, develop quantum theory or anything else for that matter. Uh, on the contrary, the theory of evolution leads to the opposite conclusion. It places humans firmly within the natural world, takes them to be biological organisms, which like others necessarily have scope and limits including the cognitive domain. So those who accept modern biology should be thoroughgoing mysterians. Well, dropping the untenable recourse to natural selection, we're left with a serious and challenging scientific inquiry to determine, try to determine the innate components of our cognitive nature in language, perception, concept formation, theory construction, artistic creation or other domains of life. And a further task is to try to determine the scope and limits of human understanding while recognizing that some differently structured intelligence might regard human mysteries as simple problems and wonder that we cannot find the answers. Uh, just as we observe the inability of rats to run prime number mazes simply because they lack the concept by the very nature of their cognitive capacities. And far from bewailing the existence of mysteries for humans, we should be extremely grateful for it. Uh, if there are no limits to abduction, uh, then our cognitive capacities would also have no scope. Just as if the genetic endowment imposed no constraints on growth and development. In that case, an organism can only become some shapeless amoeboid creature reflecting accidents of an unanalyzed environment. Uh, the conditions that prevent a human embryo from becoming an inse inse insect also play the decisive role in determining that it can become a human. And the same holds in the cognitive domain. It's a simple logical point. And so the classical aesthetic theory recognized the same relation between scope and limits, recognized that without rules, there can be no creative activity, even when the creative activity challenges, tries to revise prevailing rules. Uh, honesty should lead us to concede, I think, that we understand little more about creativity than the Spanish physician philosopher Juan Huarte did in the 16th century when he distinguished the kind of intelligence humans share with animals from the higher grade that humans alone possess and is illustrated in the normal creative use of language and proceeding beyond that from the still higher grade illustrated in true artistic and scientific creativity, uh, nor do we know whether these are questions that fall within the scope of human understanding or whether they are among what Hume took to be nature's ultimate secrets consigned to that obscurity in which they ever did and ever will remain. 